this game. This is a game we were all expecting Marvel's Avengers to be. It's what we all wanted it to be. But where Marvel's Avengers failed with its narratives, its mediocre gameplay and false promises, Marvel's Guardians of the Galaxy breaks barriers in the non-live, single-player action-adventure genre to reach new heights. Welcome to my review of Marvel's Guardians of the Galaxy. Obviously, if you do like the review, please go ahead and leave it a like, and I would appreciate a sub to the channel as well. Of course, just like with all my reviews, this one's going to be spoiler free, and the footage shown is only going to be from about the second or third hour in the game, just to keep things a surprise. But let's get into the review. Now let's start with the story. You play as Peter Quill, leader of the Guardians of the Galaxy. Now in this story, the team is still quite new, only having band together for about the last year or so. This then leads into some great moments where they have teething issues between the characters. You do get a sense of mistrust between the team, no one fully trusts each other yet, and the walls are still very much up. Now a very vague summary of the story, a huge wall broke out and the Guardians see this as an opportunistic venture to clear some debt by capturing a rare creature for the Monster Queen, and through their actions they accidentally set off a huge chain reaction of events. This forms a large part of the story, so I'm not going to get too much into it. This will see you stepping into the Milano to travel to the different planets and space stations to put things back to how they were. Well, try to, without mucking up other things along the way. There are a lot of twists and turns and reveals, and if you are a Guardians fan or just a fan of space adventures akin to Mass Effect, you will like this game and how it plays out. The story is a decent size, sitting around the 18 to 20 hour mark and can be made longer depending on how much you explore your environment and how often you interact with the characters around you. One of the biggest strengths of the game is its unique flora and fauna that you are interacting with on a constant basis. As I said, you'll be traveling to different planets and each planet have their own unique look and feel about them. This is one of the biggest strengths of the game. It isn't open world, but it also doesn't restrict you to tiny spaces or hallways. It gives you enough space in the environments that it feels like you're able to explore a decent amount of your surroundings, but also makes it visually discernible about which way you're meant to go next. It did strike a very nice balance with this regard, and given that these are entirely different planets, the imaginations of the designers really shone through here. I loved going to new planets, new space stations, or piloting the Milano just for the excitement of seeing what next new environment is up, or what beasts are lurking within the new planets. Some were eerie, some others were bright and vibrant, but all were unique. There is also so much world building in this game, and it definitely gave me slight Deus Ex vibes, where you could take a linear approach to the story, do the minimum to beat the game and still enjoy it, or you could really lose yourself in the world by exploring every nook and cranny to get the most out of it. Speaking to everyone you can, including your own team, to get to know more about them to really start building those relationships. No surprise as both this Guardians game and the Deus Ex were developed by Eidos Montreal, so some of that DNA bleeds through here in the best of ways. Now through your interactions, you actually gain a fair amount of context, history and in turn you begin to gain a deeper level of understanding to the characters that surround you. Again, this can all be optional, however you get a hell of a lot more out of the game if you truly sink your teeth into the world around you and it makes for such a better playing experience. So not only do you get to learn about your team, but you also get to choose how you interact with them and these choices can impact their relationship with you. So it was great to see different personalities shine through for each member of the Guardians and how each react to you differently. It means you actually have to be attentive and read their body language and it feels like you're fostering real relationships. On top of that, you also get to see how each Guardian bonds with or mistrusts other members of the Guardians. Selfless. 
son of a truck. I will admit though, there is a lot of infighting and bickering between the team, especially at the start of the game, and if it weren't for Drax bringing his literal perspective to alleviate some of that tension, it would have become very stale very quickly. Now, majority of your interactions with other characters will be through dialogue options, and your relationships and outcomes of each conversation can change depending on your selection within these dialogue options. It made me more immersed with the conversations I was having. It kept me engaged because I knew that my choices really mattered. This also extends to the Guardian members themselves. Your dialogue options impact the relationships you have with each member, and that can impact how much they respect you. But it really drove home the importance of rapport building and relationship building within your team. The game also forces you into really tight situations, which can at times be surprisingly emotional. Now I did go back to certain scenes to replay and choose different dialogue options just to see if things actually changed. And it did result in an entirely different set of dialogue options and a different impact to the relationship so it really solidifies that your choices matter. There are some dialogue sequences in the game that also change the next mission entirely. One mission can turn into either a stealth mission or a full blown shootout. Again all depending on your choices. Since this is a single player story, there isn't really too much replayability, but there is definitely value in going back through the game and choosing different dialogue options to see what changes and how. Obviously the game has to keep on the same overall story arc, so do not expect infinite branching outcomes or endings, but the journey on getting to these main key points in the game can greatly differ from player to player. The villains on the whole were also very well written, compelling, and further added to the personal story that was being told. One of the villains in particular manipulates people using their past traumas and their deepest desires to kind of hypnotize them. It's called The Promise, and it was an incredibly smart ability to introduce to us in the form of a villain. This allowed the story to showcase the motivations and history of each character through flashbacks rather than setting up an entire origin story for each character. This constant drip feed of history and bite-sized chunks really lended itself well to the overall well-written story and really makes the players empathize with each character and their dubious pasts. Now let's get into the combat. One point that I hear thrown around time and time again is that you can't play as the other Guardians. You can only play as Quill and that it feels like a missed opportunity. While yes, I do feel that it would be cool to swap on the fly and control any member, I'm here to tell you that the dynamic implemented in this game works fairly well. And the decision to have you only play as Quill makes sense, but it's not perfect. Let me explain. As Quill, the leader of the Guardians, the game actually makes you feel like a true leader by giving orders and instructing your team. I completely understand the decision behind this, because if you were able to play as other characters and you primarily stuck to them, then Quill would never really feel like the leader and his presence would be minimized. He absolutely is not the strongest on the team, nor is he the most useful, but being able to delegate attacks and instructions solidified, at least to me, that he was the leader of the team without a doubt. One thing that did put a dampener on the combat for me was seeing your teammates do these crazy attacks when instructed, but Quill would never really have these moments. It made him feel incredibly weak by comparison. He does have his elemental gun, more on that in a bit, but when it comes to the larger enemies, that gun has the same damage impact as if you were shooting them with a spud gun. Often at times, you feel useless and your only way out of a hairy situation I'm assuming by design, is to instruct the team around you. Again, I understand the intention, but it would have felt a lot more satisfying if Quill himself was able to dish out some massive attacks on his own just to feel as useful as some of the other members. This then leads the player back to the original criticism of, oh, I wish I was able to play as other Guardian members. The feeling I got in combat sometimes is like looking at someone with a giant eggplant. Then you look back at yourself only to find you've got a little baby corn. You feel inferior and sometimes inadequate, like you're just not good enough. You question, should I even really be here? Hey, are we still talking about the game here? <clears throat> so how does it all work? Well, there is a Guardians mode. If you activate this by pressing a bumper, the time slows and a menu pops up. You select a team member and then you select an enemy. That member will then attack that selected enemy and each member of the team also has four abilities. So in combat, you instruct four characters using four abilities to each character. 
That's a lot of choice and some of the abilities can really change the tide of battle. It does get a little more complex as each member of the Guardians have their own strengths and weaknesses as well. Some are better at ranged attacks like Rocket, some are better at close combat and staggering like Drax. Some are better at crowd control like Groot and Gamora is great for dealing extremely high amounts of damage. A lot of the fun in this game is deciphering who is good at what and then turning your leader hat on to figure out a way in which to best meld each member's strengths to become an unstoppable force. Now keep in mind that you want to be constantly telling your guardians what to do when their cooldown ends because when left alone they kind of resort to simple light attacks and they're not very good. Now there is obviously a cooldown on these characters and their attacks understandably because some of these attacks could just carry you through the fight but I feel like there's a really good balance here. It invites strategy and forward thinking on your part. Quill can die easily if you're not careful, so you're constantly looking at your health, the situation around you, and you're always thinking how a room full of enemies can be best handled with. The game also rewards you by experimenting with different moves with a momentum meter. Basically, the more you experiment, the higher the combos and the less repetitious you are in your combat, the more this meter will increase. Once you've maxed it out, you're given the chance to do sort of a finisher move, and it's super useful when you're stuck in a room with a bunch of strong enemies. On top of that, there's also a stagger meter that you need to look out for, and obviously once this is full, an enemy becomes staggered, and the attacks that they were once resistant to become more effective. On top of that, enemies also drop different items based on how you play. Some enemies may drop more or less depending on your approach of your attack. Now Quill himself does get different elemental attacks for his blaster. You do start with an ice element and then you unlock a lightning, wind element and also a fire or plasma element. Obviously each element will affect enemies differently just based on their typing, their resistances and their weaknesses. So as you can see the combat is fairly complex and it involves a lot of strategy, assessing your surroundings and really requiring you to learn the vulnerabilities of each of the many enemy types to make an informed decision as to how you approach each room full of enemies. This isn't just mindless combat, you really do need to assess your surroundings, remember the relationships you have with your team, their abilities and coordinate attacks utilizing their strengths. One thing I really didn't like is the huddle meter. Yes, aside from the momentum meter, a stagger meter, an ability meter, the elemental meter on Quill's gun, and the character cooldowns, there is yet another meter to look out for. This one pertains to the entire team, and I feel like this one wasn't as well refined as everything else in your fights. Once your team fills up this meter, you break away from battle, huddle, and then you have a pep talk with your team. Your team's motivation and how they're feeling towards you can play a large role in this huddle mode, and you really have to assess how they're feeling and what their moods are in the heat of that particular battle. They could be cocky, or they could feel unmotivated, and it's up to you as a leader to assess and choose the right dialogue option. If you pick the right one, everyone gets a big boost of damage and their health restores and the cooldowns go away. If you pick the wrong dialogue option, those buffs only apply to Peter Quill. Now combat is generally fast paced, so leaving an entire battle scene in the heat of the battle to have a pep talk and a 50-50 shot of picking a dialogue option severely disrupted the momentum of a battle for me. I can see what the developers were going for, and it is cool in theory, however I just felt the execution fell flat. Let's talk a little on the exploration. I'll have more to say on this later, but one thing I really loved in this game were the suits. There is something like 40 different outfits that are unlockable throughout the game, and these can be unlocked by exploring your surroundings and finding collectibles hidden in the different locations. You can also find a bunch of easter eggs in this game to the history of the Guardians in the comics and also other characters just in the Marvel comic universe. I do think exploration could have been handled a little better, but I'll get into that in my negative component. Now the music and the voice acting. On the whole, the voice acting was pretty damn good, and they did a really good job of having the other members of the characters react to what you're doing. For example, Rocket will call you out for picking up collectibles, but saying you're just picking up a pile of junk. What's Captain distracted up to now? If he calls us over, I'm done. Whoa, 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 guys, there's this totally sweet pile of crap on the ground. So interesting. Let's all stick our fingers in it. I can hear you downwind. I can hear you downwind. Come on, guys. We're a team. Let's all work together. Blah, blah, blah. 
Like most games, one or two lines felt a little off, but for 99% of the game, it was solid. The music, as you'd come to expect, were full of 80s hits, none of which I can obviously show you due to copyright, but suffice to say, it completely changed the atmosphere of the game for the better. If you like the music and the selection in the two Guardians movies, you will love this. It really adds such a fun vibe to any situation you're in and enormously changed the playing experience for the better. The soundtrack is a massive strength to the game and a playlist I'll be listening to on the regular. Now speaking of copyright and DMCA, there is a streamer mode that turns off licensed music, but that really took away from the impact of some of the story beats. Thankfully, it doesn't take the Life is Strange approach where it completely takes away the music, it does replace it with other music, however, obviously those moments and impacts just aren't the same without the originally intended music. I understand completely as a streamer why you'd want to turn these off, you'd obviously don't want to get your accounts banned, but you're really doing yourself and the game a disservice. Songs have been specifically selected to play at certain moments. Taking that away results in the significance or grandeur being heavily reduced. If you want to stream it, make another save file for offline play so you can really be immersed with how the game was originally designed to be played. Now bugs and performance. This game is fairly big on the PC with an initial 80 gig install file. Yes, it's not the biggest out there, but this was actually sitting at 150 before last minute optimizations brought it down to 80 thankfully. Within that 80 gigs for the PC, I can happily say that it ran pretty well. Frames were made solid on the whole, and I didn't really come across too many bugs that were game breaking. You get your usual pop ins or Peter not grabbing onto ledges, you know, just the basic stuff. I did hear of other players having issues with characters looking like shadows in the menus, or the game thinking that you're playing with a Switch controller for some reason, so you'll want to be on the lookout for that. This game also has one of the most comprehensive menus and customizable setting selections that I've ever seen. It actually allows you to tweak specific difficulties within difficulty presets. Everything and anything you'd want to change from graphics, performances, audio, surround sound configurations, subtitles, music choices, etc. It's all in here. And it's actually a little overwhelming at first as to how much choice you have in terms of optimizing this game for your specific needs and setup. But it's a very welcome addition. More choice is always better in my view. Now the lighting and the environments are absolutely phenomenal in this game. It's so well optimized and the surface textures and lighting themselves are some of the best I've seen in years. It's done so well that I was constantly taken aback while being introduced to new locations every 1-3 to three hours. With that in mind, you'll be thankful to hear that yes, there is also a photo mode. And I can't wait to see what the community comes up with with these amazing new environments. Let's move into the negatives. Now I've already touched on the huddle mode and how I thought that at times it really disrupted the combat. Now the bickering between the guardians was also a negative in my mind. Yes it was welcome at the start because it does give a nice reference point and a point for progress to be made, but there was still fighting by hour 10 to 12. It got really tiresome. Another negative is Peter and his elemental gun are cool in practice but you just can't help but feel inferior by comparison when you look at the other guardians to see their damage outputs. I would have also liked a little more exploration. This game has some of the most impressive world building set pieces, locations and art design I've seen in recent years. So it's such a shame that I walked away feeling like I couldn't really explore these areas to my heart's content. I would have liked to see a little more of Deus Ex bleed through in this regard, allowing us to tackle an area from any angle we want and just letting us go wherever we want. Lastly, the word Flarken. Once you're done with this game, you'll never want to hear this bloody word again. It's said every second or third sentence all throughout the game, and it just got on my nerves so much. I know that's a really petty complaint, but it just annoyed the ever-living shit out of me. <laughs> so, overall, this game is fantastic. I did have my trepidations going in, as I'm sure many others did seeing Square Enix on the box after what happened with the Avengers game, but this game is an absolute blast from start to finish. It has solid writing, it goes above and beyond and not only shows you the origins and motivations of the new takes of these characters, but also makes you care for them. The music was perfectly selected to complement the well-rounded story and the imaginations really shone through with the other worldly beasts, spaceships and new planet terrains to explore. It is an emotional story that, when completed, leaves you in a complete admiration for what has just been achieved and what you just experienced. 
I do feel like a lot of people are sleeping on this game, however I can happily say that this game is worth picking up at full price. There is so much meat to this game and it's refreshing to see so much love and dedication that's being poured into an offline, non-live service single player game that has no microtransactions or anything like that. But guys, that is my review of Guardians of the Galaxy. It was a long one and I do appreciate it if you made it this far. If you like the review, please go ahead, leave it a like and also subscribe to the channel. And to let you know, I have a Discord that I've set up. A link to that is also in the description below. But again, thank you so much for watching this video. Stay safe out there and I'll catch you in the next one. What is that? Definitely not a monster. Adorable. It's more matted than an Asgardian goat.